welcome everybody to the second session of the NADP HEDEP seminar series. This is Christy Morris. Um, I work for the National Park Service. Um, and we can go to the next slide, Mike. Uh, so just a reminder for those of you that maybe didn't join us during the first session, um, the white paper was on science needs for continued development of total nitrogen deposition budgets in the U.S. It was an effort led by John Walker, EPA ORD, and Greg Beachley, EPA OAR. It was an extensive effort over a couple years by many agencies, universities, and others. Um, there were four articles that came out in the AMA EM magazine in the July 2019 issue. Um, we were told that we can post those to the TDEP website. Um, we'll be doing that soon. Um, we also, the effort also resulted in seven articles that um, were published in Skelton, Science of the Total Environment. Um, and I believe we're still waiting to hear how we can distribute those articles. Um, but we will be hosting this um, webinar on the third Wednesday of the month at noon um, with two presentations each month. Um, and with, I believe, 19 chapters, it should take us through um, summer of 2020. So um, prepare for that. Uh, we were also able to record um, the seminar, and uh, the recording from last month is already up on the website, and we will just continue to add recordings there um, if you want to go back and see anything. Uh, next slide. So uh, the schedule today, um, we have myself from the National Park Service presenting on advancing throughfall methods for quantifying reactive nitrogen deposition, and also Selma Issel um, with Wood um, presenting on occult deposition, what we know, don't know, and should really know. Um, next month, uh, uh, Brett Schickel with the National Park Service um, has agreed to give a presentation, um, but he has a couple chapters, and he hasn't told me which one he's presenting on yet for next month. And um, also, we only have one presenter confirmed, so I'll be reaching out to the other um, chapter authors to see if anybody else would like to go in November with Brett. Um, we will likely skip December and then start back up in January. I know folks are interested in sort of getting a, um, a set schedule so that you can pick and choose topics and, and start to um, plan for those uh, different months. And we will try to do that um, in the new year. Um, so far, we've just been gathering whoever is available at the moment, but we'll we'll try to get a real plan together starting in 2020. And with that, I think I can hand uh, the presentation over to Mike. All right, thanks, Christy. Um, all right, my name is Mike Bell. I am a biologist with the National Park Service Air Resources Division. Um, Today I'm going to be talking about advancing throughfall methods for quantifying reactive nitrogen deposition. My interest in this area comes from two different spaces. One is during my PhD research at UC Riverside, I was working at Craters of the Moon National Monument and Joshua Tree National Park where I was trying to measure throughfall deposition and, and um, like working alongside Mark Fenn to get a better sense of how nitrogen was um, coming into the ecosystems. Now, as a biologist with the Air Resources Division, I'm mostly concerned in ecosystem effects of um, deposition. And so, trying to figure out when species and ecosystems are changing due to increased deposition um, across the National Park Service lands. And in order to know that, we need to know how much is coming in. And so, it's uh, and most of our, uh, the sites in the area, the most sensitive areas are far from any NADP collectors or any other network in operation. So getting a better sense of um, like 
a passive or cheap way to quantify what's coming in is really important. So this is a, a very simple um, description of nitrogen deposition um, and some of the terminology that I'm going to be using. First off, with the big black arrow is bulk deposition. This is going to be all wet and dry deposition that occurs to uh, the, the land surface kind of outside of um, a tree or shrub canopy. I then have two vegeta vegetated species, a shrub and a tree, um, just to signify that all vegetation acts as a collector of deposition, um, has um, both canopy uptake where atmospheric um, uh, particles are taken up either through the leaf surface or through the stomata um, and um, are then um, captured by the tree themselves. And then what we're going to talk about today is through fall deposition. So that um, the, the deposition that is like at first deposited on the tree surface and then is washed down through the canopy to the floor, um, again occurring both at the large tree and shrub level. Um, so through fall specifically is describing the, like, the nitrogen in this case that is scrubbed from the atmosphere as the, the, the molecules pass through a vegetation canopy. Oftentimes these are going to be settled directly on a leaf surface. And then when um, rain, snow events occur, the, that deposited nitrogen is washed through the canopy um, to the forest floor blow, below. Um, Thruful also incorporates like natural dry deposition directly to the canopy, that which wasn't, didn't de deposit directly on uh, the plant surface. So um, kind of the combination of uh, all that's coming in. Around. And so why are Thruful why does through fall matter and why is this type of um, collector important? So these collectors are relatively low cost and can function without power. And this allows for measurements to occur in hard to reach places. Like you don't need roads, you don't need, um, well, well, obviously easier, but you don't need electricity to a place. Also being, um, having a very low, small footprint and being low cost, they can give us a, a, a better estimate of how much nitrogen is, well, they, they give us, sorry, I was reading the wrong bullet. They give us a better, um, they allow us to explore local gradients a lot easier than a single um, electrical required collector. So you can put these up a hill slope, you can put these from a road to um, a more wild area and, um, get that really like with basically kind of within a grid cell gradient. Um, and using these will allow us to get an estimate of ex exactly how much nitrogen is getting to the ground and thus impacting those other ecosystem processes and how that's changing um, through space. There are two current methods of collecting through fall. Um, one is uh, ion exchange resin columns, and the other is the, what I refer to here as a conventional collector. Um, the conventional collector is made up of a funnel that collects all um, the whole, the, the entire precipitation event within um, a bucket of some a container of some kind, and then the each event is analyzed for nitrogen response, while the ion exchange resin column has a dual ion, like a resin inside uh, beneath the funnel. So the water passes through the resin and it binds the um, ions of both nitrate, ammonia, ammonium, sulfate, and uh, phosphate in there for future measurement. So kind of to go through the, the benefits of each and the challenges of that each um, have the conventional collectors generally have a, a sampling period of about two weeks or um, less, depending on the number of precipitation events that come through. 
once you cross that two week threshold, there's a chance of microbial contamination within the collector. And when that happens, it um, nitrogen transformations may occur and uh, um, alter the sample a little bit. The, these collectors um, are a sam uh, uh, precipitation event based sampler. So you're able to get a unique um, nitrogen um, value from um, each event that comes through to give a sense of how air mass patterns might be, uh, movement patterns might be influencing deposition rates. Um, alter another contaminant can be birds. If they, within a, a, the force canopy setting, it's less of an issue, but uh, because there are multiple places to perch, but birds can perch on the edge of the funnels and uh, um, organically contaminate um, each of the samples. Uh, these samples have also been used for isotopic analysis to determine sources of deposition. And this is one of the values of um, the, the per event sampling is you can really get a sense of what um, uh, the source is from uh, each event that's coming through as long as there's enough um, nitrogen collected. The ion exchange um, resins on the other hand are, um, made this fun animation of water going through, uh, ions being captured within the resin those are then flushed in a lab to um, then um, with like a with an ionic solution to measure the uh, um, what was collected. So generally, the sam sampling period here is around six months or up to a year. Oftentimes, these are they're um, swapped out within the rainy season and dry season to get. Uh, um, a kind of a better estimate of, or like the winter versus summer, to get an estimate of uh, the two like main periods of uh, nitrogen addition. Um, generally, you're going to have two sampling events per year. Um, in addition to birds perching on the tops of these collectors, um, there's also the the chance of rodents or other insects um, falling into the collectors as well. And given that they're out there for six months at a time, this can be catastrophic to a sampling plan, um, if not checked or cleaned. Um, and with the isotopic analysis, this is going to be more of a cumulative analysis um, of that six-month period. And so you're getting up the general flows of um, uh, sources um, at this point at, um, with these collectors. So the, the main val one of the main values of the ion exchange resin collectors is that they're significantly cheaper because you only visit them twice a year and you only run two sets of samples per year versus having to visit a conventional collector at a uh, um, two week time scale and running analysis on all of those samples. So. Um, there is a savings there, but you're losing some of the specificity of what's going on. So the, the so that's all the the great the benefits of it. The um, some of the inefficiencies of through fall deposition is it does not take into account the canopy capture that I was referring to earlier. This can be either deposition of particles um, directly to the leaf surface um, absorbed into the leaf or it can be the uptake of gases um, into the leaf itself. While these do um, eventually get to the forest floor through leaf fall, it is not taken into account with, with through fall collectors. One of the biggest challenges is the diversity of tree species, stand height and stand age. Each species has its own canopy characteristics, leaf, um, roughness that will affect canopy capture. Um, stem flow will be different for each of the tree species. Um, and then based on the height, the age of the canopy, um, you may, you'll, you'll be having uh, a larger like scrub brush to go through almost. Like, and so if you have a, a really tall tree with a lot of leaves, 
they're going to be pulling out a lot more of the, the nitrogen than if it's a shorter, um, sparser canopy. And so this picture on the right is just kind of showing one of the challenges. If you choose one color of tree to put your collectors under, um, it's not going to be giving you a full picture of what's actually happening in that forested area. Stem flow is when, like, when the rain events occur, um, water will naturally run down the branches and then run down um, the tree trunk and uh, thus not be, um, not fall straight through the canopy to, uh, um, into the collectors. There's also edge effects of forests. And so it's been shown that the edges of a forested area closer to a pollution source will have higher deposition as that initial push of uh, pollutants is um, captured more aggressively by the, by the tree canopy. Um, and then it, and additionally, like when we're looking at the dry deposition component to it, the funnel surface will is not a good replicant of a natural deposition surface, and thus dry deposition is, is underestimated in these spaces. Then the environmental complexity, um, snow is not, a, there's a, a low efficiency of uh, snow capture within the, the funnels themselves. The first picture I'd shown at the, at the start had a snow tube on top of it, which allows snow to connect, collect, but still doesn't um, fully fall in. As uh, I believe Dave Plow and Greg Weatherby are going to talk about later on, and there's a chapter in the white paper um, directly on snow collection. But oftentimes, doing snowpack surveys in the wintertime and combining those with uh, um, through fall in the summer is the recommended course for those. Um, for those collectors. The second is aridity. Um, in desert environments, a lot of the deposition that we have is um, from uh, dry deposition. And thus, the collectors, as you can see here out in Joshua Tree, are not um, effective. I think these may have gotten rained on once. Um, and then like while trying to develop shrubland collectors, Stem flow and then desert shrubs, especially, is um, they've uh, evolved to make the majority of their um, precipitation move via stem flow along these um, uh, diagonal axis ease of branching that gets all the the the, uh, the, th like the through fall will go directly towards the stem to make sure that all the the water stays with the shrub. So having a, a, a collector underneath there hasn't been shown to be a very effective way of collecting through fall. So through this, um, uh, the process of developing the white paper, we developed um, a future research plan. The first is, is something that I've been working on for a couple years now that's been on the back burner and really um, it's just aching to the process is developing this through fall database to compare different through fall measurements across the country, not only to one another and the forests that um, where they're collected, but also to the um, modeled maps of Tdap and CMAC to get a better sense of how those models are relating to um, deposition. The second is to do a comparison um, at uh, to can with uh, canopy flux measurements, and the last is figuring out the best way to scale through fall deposition measurements to one of these modeled grids. So where we've been at for the last year or so, I've collected, um, I've gotten data from multiple sources for which we're going to be comparing um, deposition to. I did an initial analysis for Hubbard Brook. Um, so here we have nitrate on the left, ammonium on the right. The dark, the filled in blue circles are the measured nitrate from the roof fall deposition. Then comparing it to the triangles, which are just underneath it are wet nitrate and the total nitrate, which is just above it. And 
with this um, comparison, you get the, the proper sense that wet deposition is um, expected to be below the what we're measuring a through fall total is high. And thus we're, we're, we're getting more deposition than the through fall is being measured at. Um, as, as we were saying, the dry deposition doesn't come through accurately. And thus this seems to be a, a good start to showing that these are in compa uh, comparable to um, what we're currently getting out of GDAP. Ammonium for these sites, on the other hand, was not um, well correlated. The measured decreased significantly, while um, both total and wet just had a slight increase to flat um, trend over time. So my hope is to continue doing this with more data um, in the next year or so. So the next is um, comparisons to like using canopy flux towers and um, recording um, canopy flux measurements relative to throughfall. The first way is doing this is using an inferential method, is getting bulk um, like open space uh, depos like deposition at a, at a site to get a sense of what's coming directly through precipitation, then using um, atmospheric concentrations to infer dry deposition to the leaf surface and thus get a total deposition measurement that way. The second is actually using um, the multiple uh, canopy measurements within a flux tower to understand how nitrogen is being up taken up within the canopy and how that might be correlating with below ground um, measurements. Additionally here, it would be great to get um, a vertical gradient of deposition of, of through fall to see how through fall is accumulating at different spaces in the canopy. One of the issues that we have with the um, analysis of the collected sample is that um, dissolved organic nitrogen has not been measured um, using the IER columns because of the way it's it's bound like it's bound not all um, organic nitrogen is going to be uh, contained within the column but there hasn't been a lot of effort to um, clear that up or figure out what the uh, what an accurate or what what it actually is collecting so within this process, we're hoping to pair the IERs and conventional collectors and compare like what is actually what's being measured and coming out of them and may allow us to develop a better method for um, DON. And lastly, looking at the issue of scaling up and down and both going from the model to the expected deposition. And if we have a field scale site, how do we how can we scale that up to a grid cell? especially when there's various um, uh, line cover types within the, the grid cell. One of the things, like this is kind of a experimental way of looking at this. This is from the Superior National Forest, just showing land cover variation within um, uh, the, uh, like a like a, it's a, it's a four grid cell, a four TDEP grid cell area. Um, that looking at dry nitrogen deposition from 2011, um, we, in theory, you could like we could think about placing these collectors under each of the different canopy types, whether they be the the wetland shrublands, the um, evergreens, or the mixed um, trees. Within that giving the de defining a deposition factor of what are we actually collecting relative one with one relative to the other and then creating a more accurate um, deposition map um, using the um, tree cover um, that we're seeing or using the land cover that we're seeing in each of those areas and so by doing this we'd actually get a much better um, expected ecosystem response we get a better sense of like where deposition is probably coming down and how that might be flowing via a watershed or something into modifying ecosystem processes. And so with that, hopefully we're able to develop some of these and continue 
working on them in the future. Um, but happy to take any questions. Let me unmute people if I can remember how to do this. There we go. Okay, I think everyone's unmuted. So if you have any questions, I am uh, happy to answer them. Mike, besides the Superior Forest, do you have other sites in mind or ones that are high priority for you to do next? Or? Um, I know someone from the EPA, I can't remember his name, was was doing the, a land cover base analysis for the Chesapeake watershed and uh, like actual using actual um, dep expected um, dry deposition values. Um, I imagine through the CLAD working groups, we'll be focusing on the same case studies that we've been dealing with um, uh, for our critical load assessment. So right now we're, we're looking at Superior National Forest, Voyagers National Park, Bridger Teton National Forest, and uh, Grand Tetons National Park. Mike, this is Jill Barron. I've got a question on the slide right before this one that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Could you go back to it? You actually have zero dep depositions falling on the water bodies. In that this, okay. it's, it's like it's zero to less. And so I, I, guess I should have pointed out um, this, this star. These are completely arbitrary deposition factors. Oh, I see. I, uh, that I put together for this example. Um, and this was something just to give an example of what we're trying to do. But yeah, this was how I rated them um, for dry deposition relative to each of the other forms. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Mike, this is Jim Renfro. Hey, Jim. Hey, did, on some of those examples, you, it's all nitrogen, but uh, the resin column comparison, Tdep versus measured, were you able to look at sulfate, and hopefully that's a lot better? Yeah, I think that's what that's our hope. Some of the samplers, um, some of the samplers within the, the through fault network that I've I've collected do have sulfate, and yeah, those generally have. Um, correlated a lot better with deposition just because there's less um, canopy interactions often, um, so it seems. But I just focus here, since I was mostly on nitrogen budgets for this, the white paper, we uh, right. kind of limited the scope of this presentation. Any other questions for Mike? Yeah, Mike, this is Jill McMurray, and um, you mentioned that you guys were looking at um, isotope analysis in the IR monitors, and I know Abby Hoffman did that um, for her research, and I was wondering who else is doing that, or is there plans um, to just expand that? We did a little bit of it in Craters of the Moon um, in this, uh, the research I did during my PhD. I know Mark Fenn has done it at Lake Tahoe. Um, and I think there have been a couple other um, spaces, but I don't know of anyone currently doing it on through fall data. Um, I don't know if Pam Templer did it um, with any of her urban work um, that she presented on last month, but um, I know it's something so that you was, on. Was there like a similar trend or finding among all those those studies that you just mentioned? Do you remember? The work at Lake Tahoe had um, was useful in identifying that most of the deposition appeared to be coming from mobile sources within the um, the local area. There were some near the, like the main passes that um, seemed to have more of the agriculture blowing through like an over the mountaintops, but it was, it appeared to be more of a local problem that was uh, um, the isotopes confirmed. Oh, sorry, I guess I should have been more specific. Um, between, because um, when she looked at bulk versus through fall, I think there was like an interesting pattern. Oh. Um, then you could, you know, you could tell what the preferential uptake might be 
in the canopy if it was a different percentage the ratios compared to each other? Did, did anyone else look at that? I don't think anyone else has, as far as I know. Okay, because when we were when you were discussing, you know, about getting at that canopy uptake and and that question, I'm wondering if um, I suppose can help. Yeah, that's actually and, a really good idea and something worth like putting in, like comparing, especially with the conventional collector. Is it a storm or an event based? Um, analysis of an open collector versus the the through fall um it would be interesting to see how those changed yeah thanks all right well thank you okay with that let's uh switch over to selma's presentation okay Sure. I right, should have the floor, Selma. Okay. Who was that? Oops. We can okay, ready? We're ready. All right. Okay, okay. so okay. this Let's... present. Hi. Uh, sorry, Selma. There we go. Sorry, you got to start over. I had muted everyone and you too, so. Um, okay. Go for it. All right, everybody can hear me now? Yep. Yes. All right, this presentation in the white paper is also known as a cult deposition, what we know, don't know, and should also know. And I should have added whirlwind in front of qualitative because this will be a whirlwind qualitative review. Um, lots of slides, lots to go through. Have my advancing, Chris? That one? Okay. Yeah. Hold on, we're having technical difficulties. Okay, you push that one. All right, so uh, those of you with TDEP are familiar with the fact that total deposition is usually defined as a sum of dry deposition and wet deposition. And we get that wet deposition estimates from networks like CASNET and wet deposition estimates from networks such as NADP and TN. And this assumption works pretty well for most locations, but elevations greater than 800 meters are also experiencing cloud deposition, and certain coastal locations experience fog deposition a significant portion of the time. And this map here down on the bottom right is showing on eastern U.S. the darker areas are areas above 800 meters which obviously are the Appalachian Mountains, and then we have some areas up in the Northeast um, that are also above 800 meters. Okay, so in, it was found that in high elevation environments, cloud samples are typically five to 20 times more acidic than rainwater. And this type of loading is due to a combination of factors, high frequency of cloud immersion, high wind speeds, or graphic enhancement of precipitation, and large leaf area indices of tree species, typically spruce and fir in these environments. And fog impacted coastal ecosystems also experience higher pollutant loading similar to cloud impacted high elevation sites. And CMAC currently does not address occult deposition at all. What cloud fog data are available have not been used in model development. So in order to develop scientifically defensible critical load estimates, it really is essential to be able to estimate the total deposition to ecosystems that experience significant cloud and fog impaction. Okay, so what laid the groundwork for all of this was two major U.S. studies funded by the EPA, the Mountain Cloud Chemistry Project and the Mountain Acid Deposition Program. And I basically started getting my feet wet in atmospheric um, chemistry work with the Mountain Cloud Chemistry Project, which was implemented in the mid-1980s by the Forest Response Program of NAPAP. And its objective was to characterize exposure of montane forest ecosystems to chemical, physical, and climatic atmospheric inputs to evaluate the hypothesis that acidic and other airborne chemicals were contributing to observed decline in spruce fir forests in the eastern U.S. So some of the major conclusions that came out of MCCP was that concentrations of major ions were substantially higher in cloud water than in precip, 
depending on your location within the Appalachians. Locations below cloud experience both mean lower concentrations and fewer extreme concentrations than high elevation sites in the eastern U.S. And depositions of sulfate, hydrogen, ammonium, and nitrate in cloud water represented a significant input to montane forested canopies. Um, real quick look at where um, the MCCP sites were. They ranged from Maine down to North Carolina. I have the elevations here just to show that there were a range of elevations, which is how they were able to conclude what's happening at higher elevations versus lower elevations. And you can see two of the mountains had three different elevation locations. So then we came up with MAPCO in the early 1980s, and it was part of the research that was necessary to support the objectives of TASNET. MAPCO's main objectives were to develop a cloud water measurement system to be used in a network-wide environment and to update the cloud water concentration and deposition database that was collected by MCCP. Uh, measurements were collected during the warm season, June through September, at three mountaintop sampling stations, and those would be Whiteface Mountain, White Top Mountain, and Clingman's Dome. These two sites here in the Catskills um, were sampled via a mobile collection system for a couple years, and we have some limited data from those sites. Um, in, after 1999, we lost the White Top Mountain site due to funding issues, and then after 2001, White Face Mountain was run by New York State, and Clingman's Dome was operated by EPA Region 4 and the Park Service. So a real quick look here at some old data looking at um, here, we're looking at Whiteface Mountain up in New York and two CASNET sites, Woodstock, New Hampshire and Connecticut Hill um, in New York near Ithaca. And if we want to focus here on nitrogen, since that's our focus these days, uh, the total deposition here for the two CASNET sites are just basically summing up the dry and the wet. But for the Whiteface Mountain site, we have added in cloud, and then all of a sudden you see the huge difference in deposition um, from a mountain cloud site versus cast net sites. Uh, there is a bit of a problem here with the Whiteface Mountain site in that the cloud collector was at the summit and the, the wet deposition bucket and the filter pack were at a lodge location, which was 750 meters below the summit. So we knew that we were underestimating dry and um, wet deposition because there's a significant increase in or orographic enhancement of precipitation. So to have a better feel for what might be happening, we also did the same analysis at White Top Mountain down in Virginia because at White Top, the cloud collector, the NADP wet bucket, and the cast net filter pack were all at the same location. And here we are still seeing similar results. Um, PNF-126 is um, in Pisgah National Forest, specifically Cranberry, North Carolina. And this is a site operated by Virginia Polytechnic, Horton Station near Blacksburg. And if we come down here and look at the totals, we are still seeing the same magnification in cloud for sulfur, nitrogen, ammonia, and hydrogen. And so after 2001, we were left um, with just Klingman's Dome, and this is just a map of the park showing this, this is the cloud sampling site. This is where the NADP NTN wet deposition bucket is in Elkmont, TN11, and this is the Park Service operated CastNet site at Look Rock. At one point, we had a CastNet filter pack running right up at the cloud site, but that got discontinued around 1994-1995 due to funding. So what we do with total deposition here is combine all these three. It's not ideal um, because Klingman's Dome is at 2014 meters. This, the GRS 420 site is at 793 meters and TN 11 is at 640. So again, not ideal. We probably are underestimating dry and wet in comparison to cloud, but it's really all we have to work with. So we'll take a quick look at some mountain cloud data. This here is showing sulfate, hydrogen, ammonium, and nitrate ions from 1995 through 2011 concentrations. And if you ignore ammonium, most of the rest of them are increasing from 95 through 99, 2000. And there is somewhat of a decline from 
2000 on down through 2011, which is the last year that we collected at Clingman's Dome. The dashed line here is because we did not have any data from 2008, the site did not operate again due to funding difficulties. Um, here on the left, we are looking at cloud nitrate versus precip nitrate. Uh, the precip is on the right axis, the cloud is on the left, and you can see there's about a mag order of magnitude difference between the two axes. The main takeaway from this is that they are basically both following the same up and down pattern. On the right, we're looking at nitrate values from Clingman's Dome versus Whiteface Mountain in New York, and the main takeaway there is that the Clingman's Dome nitrate values are generally almost always higher than the Whiteface Mountain values. Here we're moving on to deposition. Uh, these are seasonal deposition estimates, again from Clingman's Dome, and you can see that there is a there's sawtooth pattern, but it's basically um, a decrease from 2000 through 2011. And on the right, that's just showing the components of the total deposition. This is the cloud nitrogen, the wet, and the dry. And even if we are underestimating these, um, that's, that's only just going to make um, total deposition even higher at um, high elevation site like Klingman's Dome. Skip that one, and this is just showing uh, TVA annual NOx emissions from 2000 through 2011 plotted against the nitrate uh, concentration and depositions, and it's following along pretty well, except all of a sudden in 2011 we see, um, and even in 2010, a little increase in concentrations. Uh, what happens with concentrations and depositions do not exactly mirror each other every year due to meteorological conditions and liquid water content of the clouds. And it would have been interesting to see what happened after 2011, but we'll never know now. <laughs> so there have been other cloud water studies in the U.S. and North America. The Cloud Water Project by Weathers et al., uh, Canada's Chemistry of High Elevation Fog, the CHEF project, it was um, pretty much a sister project to MCCP because we used the same protocols and the conclusions were that the concentration ranges were comparable to MCCP and MATPRO ranges. And then Colette and all studied um, cloud water in Sequoia National Park and they compared their results to two northeastern sites, Whiteface Mountain and Mount Musilock, which was an MCCP site, and it showed that the SMP cloud water was generally less acidic. And they continued their sample collection and added in Yosemite, and they found that the Yosemite samples were more acidic than Sequoia National Park. There were some studies done in Oregon and Alaska by Borman et al., um, Mary's Peak, Oregon, and a site near Juneau, Alaska, and they found that samples from both sites were chemically similar to each other and much more dilute than sites in the eastern U.S. There were some studies done in Puerto Rico by Giota et al. at East Peak and El Yunque National Forest. This was a part of the Puerto Rico aerosol and cloud study known as PRAX. Uh, their main takeaway from this study was that when the air masses arrived from the continental U.S., they saw a decrease in pH from 6.1 to 4.9, and the sulfate sodium and nitrate sodium ratios compared to seawater were much higher, again, when they came from the continental U.S. So in the rest of the world, um, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. In Europe, there were studies done in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria as well as in England and France, and this is um, in the background home moss in the Southern Pennites, and I had to add this Tour de France picture because that's my summer thing to do. I thought it was pretty amazing, the crowd size. And I'm gonna focus a little bit here in South America and the Pacific because this is what was most fascinating to me while I was doing all of this, and that I never knew that there was a Stratiform cloud deck off the west coast of South America. That's one of the largest and most persistent cloud features on the planet. And clouds in this region have an important impact on the Earth's radiative balance and other phenomena such as tropical precip and westward propagating Rossi waves. Weathers and lichens collect the cloud water samples down in Chile from 87 to 94. And the main thing that they found was that the relatively large con contribution of inorganic nitrogen to total ionic strength was unexpected. And they also saw that the cloud rain enhancement in southern Chile was extraordinarily high for some ions. 
for example, ammonium concentrations in cloud water were 80 times greater than in rainwater, and calcium and nitrate cloud versus rain enhancements were also very high. And nitrogen is thought to be a limiting nutrient in the southern hemisphere, so several researchers have postulated that nitrogen deposition via precipitate temperate ecosystems in southern Chile is amongst the lowest in the world. And weathers and lichens suggest that cloud deposition to such ecosystems may be a very important source of nitrogen. And Benedict et al. did more work in Chile as part of the Vocals Rex, Vainlos Ocean Cloud Atmosphere Land Study Regional Experiment. And they collected samples close to shore, which they figured would be coming from anthropogenic sources as well as off the coast pristine. And as expected, their measurements showed that the coastal area was polluted while cleaner air masses were further from the shore. In Asia, China, cloud water studies started in the late 80s and some limited information was gathered, but there's not much funding put towards this. And they did their sampling at Mount Tai, which is the highest mountain in the North China Plain. And they found that the dominant ion species were ammonium sulfate, nitrate, and calcium. And their back trajectory analysis showed that 87% of their air masses originated in southern China and that these masses were more acidic. And this is a table from Guo et al., the people that did the uh, Mount Tai China studies. And this is just to show you something that we would like to do as uh, future work to add on to this is they basically compiled a, a table of um, Research, you can see some of our sites, Mount Moose Flock, Mount Mitchell. This is a Canadian site from the Chef Project, Whiteface, and then some other studies from uh, uh, Europe and Japan and Korea. And these are stuff that I didn't even get to touch. So what I looked at was just the tip of the iceberg as far as what we can compile um, out there. Um, the thing is, there's also, this is just one slide just to give you a quick look into importance of cloud drop size. Not all cloud drops are created equal. Some are smaller, some are larger. Does it matter? Yes. Uh, Colette and Associates have shown that smaller drops tend to be more acidic and co contain higher concentrations of accumulation mode aerosol species. And chemical heterogeneity can also vary between events. Um, and the differences in chemical composition of large and small drops can significantly impact chemical deposition. So that's a whole other area of research there that can be continued. So on to fog. Fog chemistry started in, in this 20th century research into it. It intensified in the late 1980s in conjunction with all our acid rain research here and the discovery of highly acidic fogs. There's two types of fogs, radiation fogs, which are formed by cooling of land after sunset, and when cooled and stabilized air reaches a saturation point. Most fog research has centered on Italy's Po Valley and California's Central Valley. Both areas experience large emissions from extensive agricultural activities and activities associated with dense populations. They also share topographical and climatological patterns that facilitate the formation of fog. Coastal fogs, which are known as stratocumulus fog, are common in marine geographies and for us most notably west coast of California, Chile, and Africa. In most Pacific coastal systems, fog is the primary and sometimes the only source of water for plants and humans. It's a key moderator of local and regional climate and influences productivity of the near coast terrestrial ecosystems. And they have found that in coastal redwoods region, less than 3% of annual precip occurs in the summer. So uptake of fog water by the redwoods presents, represents up to 45% of the water source for annual transpiration. So sticking with the redwoods and looking at nitrogen concentrations in fog water, um, in redwoods as well as other fog inundated systems around the world, um, nitrogen concentrations are significantly greater than those in rainfall. And nitrogen from canopy through fall during the summer months in the redwoods provides up to 21% of annual inputs to the forest floor. And the neat thing about fog is that it flows horizontally, unlike vertically like rain, so trees at coastal edge of stands can get up to seven times more water and nitrogen via true fog to the forest floor compared to interior. 
and Fen et, al., Fen et al. have actually estimated that nitrogen deposition of fog has contributed 35% of the annual deposition at a research site in western San Bernardino compared to 13% at a site further inland. So collection methods, current and proposed. How do we get this to go? Okay, I'm going to bring them all in. So why are we not collecting what's been such a problem? Well, it, it isn't easy. Elevations above 800 meters aren't exactly easy to get to. There's not much infrastructure. There isn't any electricity. You have to use solar and batteries. Up here on the upper left, this is the top of the 80-foot uh, tower that used to be at Clingman's Dome. This is the cloud collector. Here's uh, one at Whiteface Mountain. This itself is a collector itself. This is a passive type collector. These are all Teflon strings. And when it's triggered by cloud, it will go up and down from this housing. This is a particle volume monitor that senses cloud. It also um, gives us the liquid water content of a cloud. This is an optical rain detector, which is necessary because we define a cloud by liquid water contents greater than 0.05 grams per meter cubed, temperature of 2 degrees centigrade, and no precip. Now, currently, if you guys, some of you might remember Peter Weiss from um, University of California, Santa Cruz. He came to the NADP conference at Asilomar. And he gave us a presentation of some current fog research that he was doing. This is something he's working on currently. Um, he hopes to get this done by January of 2020. And it's a combination of a passive fog collector and an active fog collector. The active fog collector is Caltech Active Strand Cloud Water Collector. And Jeff Collette and his colleagues use this a lot in their research. The passive fog collector is basically a one square meter mesh that hangs vertically since fog flows horizontally. And when the fog is intercepted by this mesh, the water drips down into an optical rain sensor and into a tipping bucket rain gauge. And the purpose of the passive fog collector is to quantify the amount of wet deposition by fog to a one square meter area. Um, this whole kit here costs about 16K versus that uh, particle volume monitor that I showed in the slide before was 20K just by itself. So this is a lot more um, affordable and maybe it will help um, for future fog research. And I wanted to show another part of what Peter is doing. There's some ecological applications that are very interesting. He and his colleagues have examined whether pumas in coastal central California and their associated food web have elevated concentrations of monomethyl mercury, which could be indicative of their habitat being in a region regularly inundated with marine fog. So they looked at adult puma fur and whiskers, and they looked at total mercury concentrations because they said that was a good surrogate for monomethyl mercury. And they found that the fog influence study region had three times higher mean total mercury concentrations compared to samples from inland areas of California. I have this uh, map here from his study, not so much for data reasons, but just that dotted blue line is the breakpoint between his coastal region and his inland region. And pumas in California eat primarily mule deer and the total mercury in deer fur from the two regions was also significantly different. And so the authors suggest that atmospheric deposition of monomethyl mercury through fog may be contributing to this pattern since they also observed significantly higher monomethyl mercury concentrations in lace lichen. Here's a picture of that. Um, it's a deer food and also a bioindicator of atmospheric deposition at sites with highest fog frequencies. So to wrap up here, future work, we would like to continue sampling to assess current conditions um, and to aid in development of a standardized and comparable sampling methods because there are you know, passive active collectors, there's different ways of measuring liquid water content, and people have been using lots of different methods throughout the world. Um, it would be nice to do a complete literature review consolidating historic research, produce standardized data sets, 
and produce a data archive of cloud and fog sampling studies. I'm thinking of this as similar to what is TDEP is currently doing with the Flux database. Um, there should be improved collaboration between cloud and fog research communities, and least but probably most important, use of available measurements to improve modeling approaches. And I couldn't end a TDEP presentation without a TDEP map. So this is TDEP, total deposition of nitrogen from 2011, and believe me, I blew this up big time at home last night. Klingman's Dome is about here, and that looked to me like about a nine on this scale here, nine kilograms per hectare, and just cloud water nitrogen deposition at Klingman's Dome from 2011 was 7.947, so just cloud alone, so we could be underestimating by up to half what the total deposition would be in areas with cloud, and probably a similar result would be found for fog deposition. And that's it. I'll take any questions. All right, everyone should be unmuted now. So if you have a question, just ask. <laughs> So have any of these Look studies, this. this is Mike, have any of these studies uh, looked at leaf uptake, like similar to the fog um, uptake studies on the, on the coast of cloud deposition or this, uh, from the clouds? Not that I'm aware of actual uptake by the leaf. Yeah, like if there's any, like if, like if this deposition is actually getting into, like going down to the ground or if it's just being taken up. Um, at the leaf level, or the tree like along the tree. I am not aware of any studies done at the leaf level, but doesn't mean there aren't any. That would be very interesting to do to see what exactly is getting into the plant itself. Is Donna Sweetie or any other modelers on the line? I'd like to ask um, uh, what they need in order to start incorporating some of the data um, that we have. I imagine they need probably more data. <laughs> but um, Selma, I don't know if you can comment on that or not or if anybody else can. I had a brief email exchange with Donna in that, yeah, they, they have not done anything with occult and it's something that they have talked about in the past and it is in their future plans to discuss again, but that's about it. On the, on the long list, I assume. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any other questions for Selma? Go. Oh, good. Tell them that's Barkley. I'm good. Hey, Barkley. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I've got a question about stuff from Chile, just because of uh -huh. curiosity. Um, you know, you've got Santiago, you know, long, skinny Chile. I don't know where any of this, I don't know where the stuff was done, but really the question is, you know, you have effectively one of the the most polluted urban megacenters on the planet there and sort of the, you know, the nitrogen deposition that you're saying, were they able to allude that to what was coming from Santiago? I would have to go back and look at the references. Um, there was, there were not any major conclusions tying anything specifically to a specific city. Okay, I was, uh, you, I'm sure you weren't anticipating anyone asking you about Chile, um, but that just... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, to me, that was, like you said, the most fascinating of the worldwide studies is what was going on down there. So um, I can uh, forward you some of the references for that section if you're interested. Sure. I always like okay. my horizons. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a uh, question. Selma, this is uh, oh, you can go. 
Okay, uh, this is uh, Georgia Murray with Appalachian Mountain Club. And uh, we've been running a cloud, a passive cloud collector on the slopes of Mount Washington since the early 80s. So another data set that uh, we should connect over. Okay, uh, I, I assume Mount Washington in New Hampshire, right? Yes. Okay. Well, that would be awesome, yeah. Because, I mean, I'm sure there are more studies. This is the thing. Nobody's tried to pull, pull this all together. I think there's, there are probably numerous other studies within this country that we don't know about. So, um, Can I get your contact info by any chance? Sure. We work collaboratively with uh, Ralph Perrin with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, so I can send you some info or Ralph could send you the info. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. All righty. If that is it, um, thank well, you. I, oh, another I question? question. Yeah. Jump in. I was wondering if there's um, been like any sort of effort to pull together like a map of areas that we might be underestimating um, the deposition due to high cloud cover or fog. Do you think that all these studies have been pulled together? And so maybe there's a way to look at cloud cover across the country or areas of dense fog and kind of estimate where the highest risk areas are that we're underestimating. Not that I'm aware of through TDEP. Um, I mean, I know we've always talked about urban deposition and that we're not addressing that and we also know over uh, in the coastal areas over the oceans we're not sure what's going on and but then this is why this was a chapter in the white paper because we know we're not addressing a cost deposition. Uh, Selma this is Mike I was thinking about that too in, in relation to the uh, the TDEP uncertainty <laughs> metric that like John Walker just led the effort to develop of how incorporating this into like version two of that might be uh, useful. Definitely. And, I can, and scary. I can remember um, <laughs> a fog cloud frequency map from probably the mid 90s um, uh, that would identify those areas that that have high contributions likely from cloud and fog, um, but I think that map would need to be updated. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, we'll wrap it up. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I will work on the schedule. Um, and get the topics out for November and uh, next year as well. Um, the next uh, conference call will be Wednesday, November 20th. Um, I will continue to send out email announcements of these uh, calls. And if you are not receiving a Google Calendar invitations, please register through the link that is in the email, and then you should be receiving uh, those calendar invites as well. So if that is all, we will wrap it up. Thanks, and we will talk to you next month. Thank you, Christy. Thanks, Selma. Thanks, Mike Bell. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>